they're working on the rant. Oops, let me just, let me click that before I go any further. Sorry. Um, and uh, Matt is a rangeland ecologist, and he's been working with Audubon, California, since September 2019. And I think that's when Audubon, California, actually started the program. So you've been kind of in it since the the very beginning of the program here in California. Yeah. And uh, he's got 15 years experience in various conservation and management jobs, including ranch manager for a ranch in Wyoming. He was a biologist for the Peregrine Fund in Belize and Guatemala. We'd love to hear about that too, some other time perhaps. <laughs> and an ecologist with a, a Trihydro Corporation focusing on restoration ecology. And uh, Matt has several degree, a dual degree in environment and natural resources, rangeland ecology, and watershed management from the University of Wyoming. So coming to us from up north. And uh, Matt is joined today with Shanae Risby. Hi, Shanae. And Shanae's just started at the Audubon Conservation Ranching Program. She's been there, I think you said, uh, three months? <laughs> yep, around three, four months, yep. Uh huh. All right. And she's the senior outreach coordinator for Audubon Conservation Ranching. And she's helping out Matt with a lot of the details. So he doesn't have to do it all himself these days. Thank you, Shanae. Shanae will be monitoring the chat box and um, uh, she will help Matt with the questions at the end of the presentation. So we'll hold our questions for then. So thank you, Matt. Take it away. Uh, thanks, Trisha, and thanks for having me here. Uh, it's cool to see folks. Um, I love interactions, so I, I totally understand if you want your privacy, but if you want to be on video, um, feel feel free to hop on and, and, and say hi. Um, I just wanted to, to thank the Shasta Birding Society for the big step that they took with EDI and B uh, by changing your name. Um, that's a big deal. Uh, for a lot of chapters, and I know it's a lot of work. Um, thanks for the invite, and thanks for the the things that you guys are doing on the ground. So I I'm pretty sure that the Shasta Birding Society chapter coverage is as big or bigger than any other chapter in the entire state of California. So you guys have a, a big footprint as far as like the places that you're doing things. Thanks for participating in Audubon's advocacy days where we work with legislation, uh, the work that you do for Christmas bird counts, backyard bird counts, the field trips that you guys go on. Um, I, I know there's a lot of people that volunteer a significant amount of their time to the nest box programs, your education programs, um, you know, b potentially banding birds or banding sawets. Uh, and so I just wanted to thank everyone for being here tonight because it's a pretty cool thing to have a grassroots conservation organization around birds in Shasta County. So uh, thanks thanks for having us. Um, as Trisha said, uh, I have a passion for, for wildlife and for places outdoors. I grew up on my parents' ranch in, in Wyoming, which is like classic sagebrush steppe, uh, rangelands, and... and just in my adult years, I have seen those habitats fragmented and lost to different types of disturbance and development. Um, and so it's become a passion of mine to try to conserve birds and uh, and the people that utilize the, the same areas. So I'll go ahead and just hop into the presentation. I'm gonna be going kind of quick today. I got a lot of slides. I hope I don't overload anybody, um, but Shanae is gonna be monitoring the chat and then I think after the presentation, um, we can get into questions and have discussions. And so hopefully I can make it uh, relatively painless for everyone here. So uh, let me see if I can uh, share my screen here. Um, and then I'll, I'll start from the beginning. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, sounds good. Um, so we kind of already did the, the initial introduction of Audubon's conservation ranching program, but I just wanted to give a little bit of a background 
on the state of ranching as a conservation strategy, in particular here in the state of California. Uh, so a significant part of the rangelands of California, which are over 40 million acres. Um, so to put things in perspective, California is around just a million acres, 40 million of that 90 million. So around half of California is considered rangelands. Most of these rangelands are privately owned. And we know that these privately owned lands provide habitat, not just for birds, but for all of these other ecosystem resources, sequestration of carbon, clean water. 90% of the water that flows into the Central Valley that's used for agriculture flows through rangelands. Um, it produ they produce a lot of food, fiber, open space, recreation opportunities. There aren't that many economic incentives for good land stewardship. And so, you know, folks managing their land often manage that for the one thing they get paid for. And the one thing they, they get paid for is their cattle. And so they, they manage for peak production on their animals. There's not that many economic incentives to sequester carbon or do good things for water um, and those other ecosystem resources. Uh, a lot of the ranchers that I work with here in California are land rich and cash poor. And so they own a bunch of land, but they live paycheck to paycheck, year to year. Um, the folks I'll go out and meet with, uh, they got patches all over their clothes. You know, they can't afford to buy new clothes, but their land is worth millions of dollars. And so the incentive for a lot of those ranchers is to just sell part of their land. They can make a lot more money by selling part of their property to suburban or urban development or energy development than they can from being stewards of the land and grazing. Um, so uh, to put it in perspective, um, uh, Cal Berkeley recently did a study and uh, every year we lose around 20,000 acres of rangelands in California. Now that's a hard thing for me to kind of wrap my head around, um, but we're losing it to suburban urban development, production agriculture, you know, uh, uh, nut orchards, vineyards, and then also to different types of energy development. So uh, that's a little bit of background. <clears throat> a while ago, Audubon, California, um, surveyed a bunch of ranchers within the state to see the types of programs that they would be interested in. And this is a reflection of that survey and improving wildlife habitat on their properties was their number one priority of every rancher that was surveyed. Um, so we took that back and we know that ranching has been used as a conservation strategy for a long time in the state. And I like to use this photo in particular, it came from our director's archives, um, but based on people's haircuts and the colors that they're wearing, you can tell it was mid nineties and there's birders, ranchers and environmentalists all out together uh, trying to meet the same objectives and goals. Um, Audubon started their landowner stewardship program in 1999 and Bobcat Ranch that we're using as a model ranch and flagship site for our program was purchased in 2007, specifically to make a sanctuary for blue oak woodlands and the birds and species that utilize them. Um, there's quite a few other partners that we have and other organizations that do work on rangeland conservation in the state. Our program wouldn't work without these partners. So the Nature Conservancy, Point Blue Conservation Science, Defenders for Wildlife um, are, are all kind of key players in it. Um, you know, for the first almost two years that I was in this position, I was uh, the only faculty member for the program. And now we've sort of expanded our capacity. We have four other people on our team, um, but it's a hard thing to do with only a few folks. Um, and then, you know, forming coalitions with some of these other partners, including the California Rangeland Conservation Coalition. The purpose of our program at its center um, is to stabilize declining grassland bird populations. And we, we, we try to do that by partnering with these private landowners as land stewards. Um, the secondary purpose of our program is to create a market-based incentive that can reward ranchers for doing good things for stewardship on the ground. The reason we're doing that, and as most of you probably know, our bird populations are declining. Bird populations have 
precipitously declined over the past 50 years. Uh, around 18 year in 2018, I guess that's around five years ago, uh, Audubon worked with uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology to compile historic monitoring and population data um, and came out with some data sets that were pretty staggering. And the thing that jumps out to me at this graph are two things, and you can probably see them right off the bat, um, is the red line is grassland bird populations. So grassland birds have declined more than any other population of bird in North America. And there's one bird, wetland birds, that has actually increased. And you can see sort of where the shift happened or finally happened. Um, and it was after the protections for wetlands came into place in the mid-1970s. They dropped a little and then they came up. So we know that conservation of critical habitats can increase bird populations. And so, you know, wetland birds and waterfowl is a success story. Grassland birds continue to decline. Um, this is just a, another piece of, uh, uh, or just a graph to show folks how much more grassland birds have declined than any other birds. We know the major threats to birds. And so Audubon went to their think tank and to our science team um, and tried to quantify uh, different threats to birds and how they will change habitat utilization and bird populations across North America. This tool that came out was called Survival by Degrees. And it came out in the in 2020. And it's actually a cool online sort of interface and platform where you can look at these different drivers that affect bird populations. Those are sea level rise, urbanization, crop expansion, extreme spring heat, which causes snowmelt quicker, wildfires, and spring drought. They then took a look at these drivers and where birds currently occupy and how the range and habitat utilization of those individual birds would shift um, based on these incremental increases in temperature. And one thing that kind of stood out at me uh, was when I took it the, uh, a look at the Western Meadowlark. Uh, the Western Meadowlark is the state bird of my home state, Wyoming. It's also the state bird of five other states. It's like, why would so many states have the same state bird? Uh, and so I took a look at the Western Meadowlark and survival by degrees and how their populations would shift based on a two degree centigrade temperature increase. And as you can see here, um, where they live in California, they could be completely extirpated from the state. And to me, that's a little bit staggering because Western Meadowlarks are this icon of healthy grasslands. They're a very common bird that's in steep decline. And if we don't do things for their habitat now, they might not exist in California anymore. Um, and so I included this picture of the Western Meadowlark because they're, I don't think they're actually partying. And I think it's ironic that their Latin name is uh, Sternella neglecta because we have been neglecting them a little bit. So between 1966 and 2015, um, their populations fell by 3% a year. I'm like, okay, 3% a year. That's the cumulative decline of 89% in Western meadowlarks. So they're still probably the most common grassland bird species. But if you go out and you see a single Western meadowlark on a fence post to wrap your head around it, you know, 50 years ago, there was nine more of them uh, on that fence. The reason is, is because their habitat has is healthy grasslands. They nest on the ground, they forage on the ground, um, all of their food comes from the ground. And so now their status is a, is a very common bird, but they're in steep decline. Um, I'd like to look at a, a few other iconic species of California. When the, this program came to California, um, it was focused on grasslands. Well, there are some remnant native grasslands in California, but most of the landscape has been altered and a significant part of California rangelands aren't considered grasslands. So there's rangelands throughout the state that don't have your classic suite of grassland birds. California quail is one of them, the state bird of California. Um, and if you look at look closely at the map here, uh, the California quail with these incremental temperature increases is going to lose a lot of its range here in the state. Um, another classic blue oak savanna species is the acorn woodpecker. 
um, they're going to lose a lot of their range too. Um, and the majority of quail habitat and acorn woodpecker habitat are private lands that are grazed by private cattle operators. So we know that the major threats to grasslands, in particular in California, are land conversion, poor management, invasive and non-native species, and, and climate change in general. So it, it presents us with this challenge. How do we affect change on rangeland management that can reverse the decline in bird species? But it also presents us with this opportunity to where we can connect conscientious, conscientious consumers to producers who are doing good things for properties. I don't wanna move on too much further in the presentation without talking about fire and fire resiliency. Um, I know you guys um, have had to experience uh, some of the gigafires and have fires almost annually in your area. Bobcat Ranch, where I live, has the highest return fire frequency in the state. Um, and it's kind of a weird thing that it is starting the fires. The thing that starts the fires on Bobcat Ranch is boats. People's boats start the fires. And that's the weird thing. People are like, oh, what, boats? Um, there's a lot of recreationists that drive to Lake Berryessa, and our property borders Highway 128. And boaters that go up in the summertime drag their chains, and it's the ignition source for all of the fires that start here and work their way into the Berryessa and Snow Mountain Range, as well as this interface with suburbia so we got a bunch of boats starting fires out here 80 percent of bobcat ranch has burned uh, in the past 10 years out of the past 12 years it's burned seven times so it provides us an opportunity to assess risk um, and develop a partnership with cal fire so bobcat ranch has a vegetation management plan with cal fire um, which helps us access state and federal funding for um, fire prevention and restoration. As part of that, we can monitor carbon flux in soils and create several other opportunities for us to use prescribed fire and prescribed grazing for land management and then be able to share that with the ranching community. So we know that grassland birds are facing a crisis. How, how can we achieve sig significant and lasting changes at a scale to reverse bird, pop bird declines? Um, it's by connecting management of livestock to the market demand for healthy food. I have a friend who's a paleontologist, and uh, he did his research on tooth wear in prehistoric mammals. And then he pieced together um, prehistoric ecosystems to see what those animals were eating. And I consulted him because our program nationally started in the Midwest um, in endangered tall grass prairies and worked its way to California, a lot of people talk about how bison shaped and changed landscapes. So we know that in North America, we historically had grazing herbivores, um, the graze grass down, and the plants and the birds that utilize them evolved in these mosaic ecosystems caused by grazers. And so everyone in the Midwest for our program was saying, oh, cattle mimic the role of bison. In California, after consultation with my paleontologist, found out that in California, bison went extinct around 10,000 years ago. So we can't necessarily use that as an argument for grazers in California. What we can't, what we do know is that there were other grazers between the elk and the antelope uh, and the deer. Some of them were browsers, some were grazers, but they mimic the role of these native grazers by creating diversity on the landscape and a mosaic within grassland ecosystems. One of the things that our program does is try to partner with ranchers in business. And this is a, a chart that I like to use um, that I sometimes uh, have a hard time following, um, but uh, empowering consumers to buy something. So Audubon has a seal that our producers can use on their products. So we can empower consumers knowing that they buy product from bird-friendly land. That in turn can create a premium and rewards good practices for ranchers on the ground. Um, doing good practices creates the habitat for birds and wildlife, um, which ties into being able to monitor that through the biological monitoring systems 
that we use. And I, I love this picture. Um, this woman's name is Nora Harper. Her and her mom run a ranch outside of Farmington, California. It's uh, just east of Stockton. And during the big drought uh, two and a half years ago, it were the two driest years on record. All of the neighbors had to sell off their cattle. Their parcels were bare ground. They ran out of grass. They didn't know what to do, and they thought they might go bankrupt because of the drought. Well, next door, Nora and Susan had more animals than they had, and they had this much grass on their place. And it was because of the rest rotation grazing regime, the way that they've built up soil organic matter in their soil. And as you drove down the road, every single grassland bird was on one side and there was zero on the other. And so um, just a cool story I like to tell about how it's it's not uh, an ethical issue, um, but potentially a, a management and, and technical assistance issue uh, that folks are dealing with. Um, nationwide, our program has grown pretty steadily. Like I said earlier, it started in the endangered tall grass prairies of Missouri, worked its way through the mid grass, the short grass, and then the sagebrush step of the Rocky Mountains down to the Chihuahua grasslands of Texas, and in 2019 came here to California. So this kind of gives you an idea of the, the breadth of our program. Um, but we here at ACR National feel like we need to have a hemispheric approach to grassland bird conservation. And so that's why the, the program uh, has grown so steadily throughout the American West. Here in California, we have uh, 22 fully certified operations on over a quarter million acres. Um, and I have actually had capacity issues where we have more people reaching out to us that wanna be a part of the program uh, than, than we can fully supply uh, technical assistance. And so it's a good problem to have. Uh, the key elements of, of our program are that a, a grassland or rangeland ecologist will develop a habitat management plan specific to a ranch. Um, after that plan is developed and that relationship is built, um, we then use a third-party auditor, the Food Alliance, who can certify the property uh, as bird-friendly. Once that has happened, and a lot of people think like, oh, that's the end all be all. Once that's happened, we've actually established those relationships and trust with landowners is when we can start doing work on their properties and work on workshops and habitat enhancement and restoration. We then go out and we monitor their properties, help them with market connections and messaging and marketing for their products. The key elements of our program or the foundation of our program is based in our protocols. If you look at other beef certifications on the market, um, they cover a lot of these things but none of them cover habitat management. So our protocols cover animal health and welfare, and that requires that animals aren't fed hormones, they don't use animal byproducts, uh, antibiotics are not allowed, and people have to prove that their animals um, have cover and are um, and just that they're using best practices available for how they treat their animals. Environmental sustainability is a big one, and this one is very similar to the organic certification. So we restrict the use of pesticides, herbicides, neonicotinoids, um, and require people to protect riparian habitat from grazing. And so that's all good. You know, a lot of places um, do the, those things to meet their organic cert or their global animal partnership cert or their grass-fed alliance certification, but no one really looks at habitat. They don't look at the wildlife habitat. They don't think about habitat on the ground. And so Audubon's certification brings that habitat piece where our ecologists can work directly with landowners uh, to think about the critical elements um, that grassland and rangeland birds need. And so we develop the habitat management plan specific for each ranch. We identify and target focal bird species on their place and then think about how we can alter or change grazing regimes um, to mimic disturbance cycles and, and help different birds. And I, I think the key piece with our focal species are, focal species are indicators of ecosystem health. 
And there is no silver bullet or catch all for grassland bird species because they've all evolved to use kind of different segments and be in different trophic levels. And so um, that's the key piece about this habitat management plan development uh, is that we work hand in hand with an operator thinking about the things that they need for production and the things that wildlife needs. This is an, an example of a reference guide that we could develop as part of one of these plans. And this comes from Bobcat Ranch. And the thing that I wanna point out is the number one goal category or goal and objective is infrastructure. And people will ask, well, why is infrastructure your number one goal when you're trying to conserve birds? Well, for ranchers, that's the priority. Like you can't do conservation work if you don't have fencing, if you don't have water developments if you don't have proper corrals. And so expanding infrastructure and capacity on a ranch and tying ranchers into funding opportunities for that is the first step towards conservation work. Uh, and this is an example of the focal bird species here at Bobcat Ranch, and then um, specific things associated with their nesting habitat that could revolve around grazing. So we really focused on nesting season because that's what makes more birds. Our third party verifier, like I said, is the Food Alliance. They conduct a desktop audit of uh, the habitat management plans that we develop. And then they actually go on site and use our protocols as a guide um, for auditing the places that want to receive the certification. And so our audits are one year, three year, six year, and 10 year audits. And within the timelines of a plan, there's goals that people have to meet for each of those. We can't really tell our story or work with ranchers um, and tell them that adaptive management is good if we can't prove it. And so we do ecological monitoring on all the ranches that we work with. And when the program first started, we worked with uh, Point Blue Conservation Science as part of their range monitoring network to correlate um, shifts in soils, vegetation, and how that affects bird populations. Monitoring is the most expensive thing that we do as a program, and it's really hard to work on 60 different ranches and collect the same type of data. So we've gone back and we've revamped um, some of our monitoring efforts um, for soil health, we look at these critical elements, uh, texture, soil organic carbon, bulk density, and water infiltration. And I like this figure because it sort of, sort of shows the interaction between the two. So um, these are all things that are affected by grazing. And um, it's important to know that um, as you decrease water infiltration, your bulk density goes up and your soil organic carbon goes down. And so by changing a grazing regime, um, you can drastically affect the amount of carbon that's in your soil and the amount of water holding capacity. Uh, for vegetation, we do the point line intercept transect surveys, um, which take a look at ground cover, diversity, and species composition. And then for bird monitoring, we do classic point counts and riparian transects uh, to look at the change of specific species over time. Now that's kind of a lot of monitoring, but then we provide that monitoring information to Audubon's national science team that puts it into a tool we call the BFI or bird friendliness index. And the bird friendliness index basically takes a look at the abundance, diversity, and resilience of bird populations and puts it into an index where particular ranches get certain scores. And that data is compared to data that's collected off of ranches. So we can make basically a one-by-one -one comparison to tell a ranch how they're doing in relation to other rangelands within their ecoregion. Um, and so on, on average, Audubon certified ranches are, are above regional averages um, and have seen 36% more abundance uh, of bird species uh, than non-certified ranches. So when the program came to California, we wanted to make sure we had the most bang for our buck when it came to conservation work for grassland birds. And so we developed this tool that was a geospatial model called a landscape prioritization. 
So we we took these 13 different factors, put them or gave them to a panel of different experts who rated one factor to another and put them in a hierarchy model. I won't list off all the factors, but they're physical, socioeconomic, and, and biological factors. So once those factors were all ranked, we then took the geospatial information from each of those factors and we overlaid it over the state of California based on their ranking. And then the final, the final map that we came out with was this. And so this is the landscape prioritization. Um, it, it took into account only the rangelands of California. And one thing that we probably need to amend is excluding deserts. So there's, there's a lot of deserts here in um, southeastern California that probably shouldn't be grazed in the first place. But the thing that jumps out to me in this model um, is the red, so less suitable ground. Well, the majority of that is in the Central Valley. So that, that's in areas that have already been developed into production agriculture. Areas that pop out are areas like the Central Coast um, that ranked really high because of wildlife habitat connectivity, overall species biodiversity, uh, climate refugia, or the resilience and resistance of an ecosystem to climate change. And we're just using this as a tool. So we, we don't want to use this to exclude anyone from participating in our program, um, but potentially want to um, put more capacity and focus in areas where we could uh, do the most help. There's a lot of opportunities for engagement in the program, in particular um, with our partners around the state doing similar things. So over the past two years, we've partnered with uh, resource conservation districts in the state. So this is a map of all the resource conservation districts in the state, uh, the current counties that we're working in, and the current RCDs that we're working with. And so we've been training local RCDs to develop habitat management plans for folks, because up to this point, it's been, it's been me in Sacramento writing a plan for someone in Modoc County. Or, or in Orange County. And so being able to tap into local expertise and people who are providing grants and working with local landowners has just been a really great idea and amazing partnership. And so we've been moving forward um, with those partnerships around the state. Like I said, monitoring is one of the most expensive things that we do. And this map is a map of Audubon chapter coverage uh, in the state of California, and it blows me away. Like there are 42 different Audubon chapters in the state that cover almost the entire state. And so here you guys are in brown up, up here. Um, so current counties that we work in are here, but developing partnerships with our local chapters is, is a priority of ours and something that we have funding for through the Wildlife Conservation Board. Um, so there's a lot of folks that wanna go out and bird new areas. And if we could connect our ranchers with our chapters, it could provide new places uh, for our chapter members to bird, but also provide critical data uh, for our monitoring projects uh, with the program. Lastly is just engagement, telling the story and networking. Um, they're cutting down the Amazon rainforest to either grow corn and soy to feed cattle or to graze cattle. We know that Beef is unsustainable in a lot of ecosystems, um, but California is the fourth largest beef producing state. And there are ways to graze cows and do good things for the environment. So being able to share that story with consumers and with our constituents uh, is an important part of the program. And then lastly is, is purchasing power. So um, I was in the Laramie, Wyoming co-op. I went to Laramie Island Co-op and I went to the freezer and I saw Audubon seal on a piece of beef. Well, when I first started this, they told me I'd feel good about buying meat. And I thought that was pretty hokey. I was like, I'm not going to feel good about buying beef. I just go buy beef. Like that's what people do. And I saw this seal in the Laramie Co-op. And so I was like, oh, I'm going to buy this. And I looked at the packaging and it said Reed Ranch. Well, in my former career, I did sage grouse conservation work on the Reed Ranch, and I knew that they were doing everything they could 
with grazing for sage grouse and sage grouse conservation. And sure enough, I felt good about buying that beef and it was delicious. And so you can feel good about purchasing beef and consumers are what will drive this program. So on our website, we have an interactive tool um, that shows where you can purchase Audubon certified, grazed on certified land um, beef products. Um, and we're gonna be expanding that, but it's it's interactive. And so you can zoom in on a map, see where you can get product. So being able to connect our chapters or chapter members that actually eat beef um, with their local rancher farm to fork is a big priority of ours. Our next steps are continuing to incorporate equity, diversity, inclusion, and belonging into the program, which is a relatively hard thing to do in the cattle industry. And so we're, we're trying to think outside the box for how we can connect with community members um, and how we can connect with disadvantaged communities um, in an industry that's been historically run by uh, rich white men. Uh, another thing is that we're engaging with partners. We can't do this without any of our partners, in particular uh, Audubon chapters, and with connecting them with certified ranches. Um, we'd like to certify more places, and it's a goal and a deliverable of our grant. Um, and once we can create a network, um, people can be able to network with other ranchers. And based on the phenology of California, folks need to move animals around. They they need to move from the lowland and dryland Mediterranean areas into high country later in the year. So being able to connect our ranchers with one another is big. Expanding our retailers. And then taking a step back and using our lessons learned, Look, looking at our data, looking at our management objectives um, and being being able to to adapt from the things that we learned um, from that data and, and from our, our objectives. So with that, I don't know if anyone has added questions in the chat, but uh, I'm happy to open it up to discussion. That was a lot of info to you guys, and I went pretty quick. So if anyone needs to take a, a bathroom break or a drink, uh, feel free, and then, um, yeah, come back and we can and talk about the program or or birds on rangelands. Awesome. And you do have a quite a few questions in the chat too, Matt. So whenever you're ready, I can throw right. those I'm, out. I'm I'm ready when you are, Sinead. Do you want to read them to me? <laughs> yeah, for sure. The uh, the first one is where do we find that last graph with the circle? So it was the major threats to birds, and it was like I think it's like five circles around that graph. That that is on Audubon's website for survival by degrees. Um, and so I could look it up here or I can send it to the group afterwards. But that was a part yeah. of the survival by degrees study. Um, and it's a real cool interface. If you guys haven't been on it yet, you can look at any bird in North America and look at how their habitats are going to shift and sort of the drivers that our science team included as part of that study. Yeah, you want to put up the link to that? Sure. Today? Yeah, I'm going to look for it right now. So... Mm. Okay, I think I found it. Sure. Okay, yep. Um, I'm about to add the link to the chat. It is crazy that they both start fires. I I love I love <laughs> I love saying that because people are like, what boats? Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's our problem here is boats. I'm sure up at Lake Shasta that could be a problem for you guys too. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you kind of hear about that fairly often uh, on the news and stuff. Or I mean, I've driven behind people that are dragging their chains and. You know, it's, yeah. it's it doesn't make any sense. People that are not that thoughtful about what they're doing. Yeah. Um, where can we find Audubon certified meat? I need to find out for Reading. Um, and so right now, I don't know if we have any producers in Shasta County. We have some in Modoc. We have some in Plumas County. Um, so we'll, I'll have to uh, take a closer look. Um, we do have producers in the general area. And the east, I think it's eastern Shasta 
Resource Conservation District have been one of the most engaged RCDs that we've worked with. And so this past year, they sent down all five of their employees to come to our training. And so we are looking for interested ranchers in Shasta County and the surrounding area who might want to participate. And so I can provide my email. My email is also on our website. But if you guys know of ranchers around that in your area that want to be a part of the program, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, individually or send them my contact info. Um, and then online, you can use the um, the tool to find retailers. And I think most of them, unfortunately, are, are sort of focused in the Central Valley and the Bay Area, but that's places at the grocery store. And so a lot of our producers don't sell to a brand, they sell direct. And so if you reach out to the rancher specifically, um, they, they sell cows by the eighth of a beef, quarter beef, half beef, whole beef. Um, but the grocery stores... Are, are more isolated to uh, to co-ops and butcher shops um, a little further south than you guys. I know when I looked on the um, the the map to find retailers near Reading, um, I think the closest one was in Chico. So I don't know how far that is from. Well, that's, <laughs> that's, that's you know that, that's an hour away. Hour. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's not far. I can go down there and maybe get some beef when I check on the Brewing Owl site. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> cool. Uh -oh. I dropped that in the chat, the link to the the uh, retail tracker in the chat as well for y'all. Thank, thanks, Shanae. Awesome. Um, we, unfortunately, we, we have sharing agreements with all of our producers. And so I think one, one thing that Audubon brings to sort of this arena is that uh, we're nonpartisan. We're non-government. And so ranchers want to work with us because we're not a government entity. Um, and that helps build trust with us. Um, and so we don't release any specific information about our ranchers unless they want us to as part of their marketing. So we can't really give a list of our ranchers or their locations out. Um, but helping promote their product is a huge thing. And one person in particular that I can think of that's close to you guys um, who's gone through a rough stint um, is, is Daryl Wood um, with Levitt Lake Ranches. And so he's he's based out of Vina, his home plant, home ranches in Vina. And uh, he was the founder of Panorama Meats. And so he created a collective of people doing good things for the land and all organic. Um, he sold off Panorama Meats meats but he's still selling his product um right out of right out of his ranch down in vina and so he's he's a cool one that we could connect you guys to um some of these producers that uh only sell like a quarter beef i was hoping to somehow form a collective with certain audubon chapters where you know if you don't have the freezer space for a quarter of a cow you know 150 pounds <laughs> that potentially you could have a sign-up sheet in the chapter and four people in the chapter could sign up and then folks could split it um, between other people in the chapter. So that was just one idea that I had for the local producers that don't sell to a brand. And you, and you said uh, you have a list of those or there's only a couple in the area? I, I could provide individual ones um, for for you guys, um, if that's what you'd like, um, you know, there are other people doing good things and we're, we're expanding, um, the folks that we work with. Um, I know that Daryl Wood has, uh, several properties that are bird friendly that he grazes outside of Red Bluff. I think the nearest place to get the product is in Binet though. Um, so that's something that I'll definitely follow up on. A lot of that, uh, property down there near Vina is uh, Nature Conservancy, right? Yeah, and, and so so Daryl actually grazes uh, the Vina Plains uh, TNC uh, property. And so uh, they've done a lot of cool research on vernal pools and the things that vernal pools need, endangered plant and invertebrate species, uh, fairy shrimp, as well as a bunch of other for forbs that grow in vernal pools. And lo and behold, grazing is a good thing for vernal pools. So all the all the non-native 
uh, Eurasian plants uh, will take over in a lot of those vernal pools. Um, and so the lack of vegetation is actually good for veg fairy shrimp um, and for some of those native forb species. Um, tying that into the bird piece, you know, they've got some uh, long billed curlews that are out there and some other um, pretty cool grassland bird species. Um, and it's critical overwintering habitat for all of these grassland birds that come down. So that's something that we haven't yet dove into that I would love to is doing winter surveys of these places because California is a hot spot for overwintering birds. And so there are thousands of meadowlarks out there right now, but then come breeding season, you know, there's only a handful. And so thinking about that aspect of the program um, has been important to us for a while too. That's where our burrowing owl habitat is. It it's is. On, it, it's on a it's on a, a ranch that was um, preserved for uh, not only uh, vegetation but for um, fairy shrimp. Cool, cool. That's great. We actually developed um, our specific eco regional protocols for California and the Central Valley around a lot of the dynamics in vernal pools and people that graze vernal pools. Um, have you guys heard about the burrowing owl? Oh, what, a, go ahead. It's a, it's a candidate for listing as a teeny species or a state protected species here in California. And so um, you We've guys- We've been trying to do that for 20 years. Yeah, you guys will start probably start hearing about that. Um, and, you know, burrowing owls are a big deal because, you know, they're not a keystone species, but they rely on other keystone species, ground squirrels and badgers and, and other folks. Um, also, it, it could affect the grazing community um, potentially in different ways. But, you know, gray, graze land is a positive indicator of burrowing owl habitat. Uh, in several areas, um, just because it removes the vegetation um, from areas that, that they want to utilize um, and have a line of sight as a defense mechanism. And so it's kind of it's kind of a balance because if we were managing for just horned larks, then people would be doing a lot different things on the ground uh, than if we were managing for Western flycatchers. And so, uh, yeah, it's a cool dynamic. One of my favorite birds. Do, do you know offhand if, let me see if I've got the name right, the Rancho Cienega del Gabalon is part of the network? I, I just heard a presentation by the ranch manager, Monterey. Oh, was Monterey County. His name is Jeff Mundell. Yeah, yeah. So I met with Jeff a few months ago. Yeah, they uh they are uh participating, and we've been working with Daryl and Jeff and Donnie down there for a while, and they're they're doing amazing things. On top of that, they uh they've got critical California condor habitat on their place. So that's I'll, a, that's a, I'll bet nice. they do. He does a. He was talking to cowboy poets in Elko, Nevada, most of whom are ranchers, and basically talking good grazing and um, native species and fire protection because fire and drought protection because of the greater depth of of native species. He was quite compelling and sounded a lot like you he's a <laughs> he's a he's a good ambassador jeff jeff is great um were you there catherine yes yes uh did you happen to run into an old-time cowboy in a flat brim cap with a handlebar mustache named kent reeves i saw him okay um, kent Kent's a good friend of mine, and he's always at the cow cowboy poetry uh, <laughs> gathering. Well, so it was yeah. it was fun. I I I went for the poetry, but I I walked away with an appreciation for grassland management. Wow! <laughs> wow. I need to go. I, I I get invited every year, but I've never been. 
yeah it was fun That's cool cool i'll have to i'll have to tell jeff i talked to you um birding opportunities at bobcat ranch yes there are good birding opportunities here. We uh we partner with the the Yellow Audubon Society, um, and they're amazing partners. They've been doing a, an eight year phenology study, uh, bird phenology study here on on the ranch, and it is mind blowing the amount of data that they've collected, um, and just just correlating seasonality and utilization of different species of birds over time here on the property and then adding on the giga fires that have happened um, in the coastal ranges and other ranges and bird species coming down um, there they are on top of it yellow audubon has been a great partner of ours and i'm trying to move forward with that um and as part of that i don't know if you guys know but uh audubon nationally has a, a phenology working group and so if any chapter wants to adopt uh, a phenology monitoring program. They sort of help guide the process. Um, and so we've done that here, training other chapters with Yellow Audubon um, to do phenology in their respective uh, geographies. And so, yeah, I'd like, to, I'd like to open it up to people. Um, so yeah, we should, we should plan it out. And I don't know who plans your, your field trips and field days. Um, but Right now, after five inches of precipitation, we were without internet for two weeks and uh, didn't have power for a while and all the roads washed out. So um, maybe we'll wait <laughs> until the shoulder season between flood season and fire season. And then uh, and then we can figure something out for coming to bird down here. What what months are those? The months you're talking? May. May. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> um, April, May. Uh, you know, de December is usually pretty good, you know, right after the dry season, um, April, April, May, maybe into June, and then uh, November, December are usually the best seasons. Okay, we'll hit you up with that. Yeah, hit hit me up. Um, You have, you guys have my email. Um, It'd be pretty cool, especially because uh, you know, this is this is critical Blue Oak Woodland. This is the central coastal foothills and mountains ecoregion. It's the bathtub ring of blue oaks around the Central Valley. And, you know, being able to compare this e the same ecosystem from 150 miles apart, I think would be pretty cool um, for everyone. Uh, I got a hairy woodpecker, a downy woodpecker, um, a Nuttles woodpecker and an acorn woodpecker all in the same day the other day down here. So it's pretty cool to have them all. We didn't get any Lewises this year, though. The past wow. two years, we've had hundreds of Lewises, and this year we haven't had a single one. So, yeah, Lewises are a strange, strange species to find. Yeah, they're pretty, pretty nomadic. So, yeah. some folks think it's about uh, the oak masting. So, uh, the amount of acorns the oaks are dropping as far as timing, but hmm. um, our phenology group could tell you guys a lot more. Um, star thistle, uh, yeah, um, <laughs> yeah. What uh, what type of info? This is like my most hated invasive species, <laughs> um, especially because we have it on the ranch, and the ranch is all organic. And so we can't spray. And so we need to think about using um, our other tools in the toolbox, which for us is prescribed fire and prescribed grazing um, and potentially multi-species grazing. Um, generally speaking, for me, invasive species um, are a symptom of a problem. And that's kind of something that we talk about with our ranchers. And so if you just target one symptom of a problem, then you're not actually addressing the overall issue. And so when we think about holistic management here on the ranch or the ranchers that we work with, we think about, okay, let's do a root cause analysis. Why, why is the star thistle there in the first place? Um, usually it's associated with uh, degradation of a certain type of environment. So they, they come in in disturbance. Well, if you don't have disturbance, then you won't have star thistle. So there's some type of disturbance and then you have seed transport. Okay, so star thistle got there, the seed was transported there. Why was that? 
A lot of times it's either associated with vehicles. Most of the time on ranches, it's associated with some kind of confined feeding operation. So you brought in hay or something that was contaminated with those seeds to a place. And so it's like, all right, let's address those causes. Let's, let's stop disturbance. Let's stop bringing things in that could potentially contaminate our area with this seed. And then we can address the actual infestation of star thistle. Um, and I'm working on restoration projects with star thistle around the state. And in every area, it's, it's a different challenge. And it takes years to get on top of. Mm -hmm. This year on Bobcat Ranch, we're using uh, prescribed grazing with cattle. Um, very time-specific grazing with sheep and goats um, and fire for some of the star thistle that we have here on the property. Thanks. That's that's good information because um, one of the main problems with the burrowing owl site is star thistle. It's 54 acres, um, and I've been talking to the manager of that property uh, about trying to get rid of it because, you know, star thistle, if it gets taller than six or eight inches, burrowing owls don't want to stay there because they can't feed. So, yeah. So that's good insight. Thank you for that. I'm 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 not going to talk about herbicides, other than right now. But sometimes, in some instances, the the first step or the first phase that people use is spraying, and so you spray the first round, and then you apply these other management actions after that, just just to be able to knock it down. Um, and timing timing's real critical around grazing, so you have to hit it just post just post bolting um or uh or it'll come up also if you have volunteers like 54 acres seems like a lot bobcat ranch is close to seven thousand acres and so you know on our restoration sites or in areas that we highly manage um we can assemble volunteers to go out with gloves and weed whackers and uh you know go, go pull and, and weed whack some stuff down um and so I, I know that's useful but not applicable on a large scale I feel like I you're think... a real experimental station there at Bobcat Ranch. You know, we for, call it we call it the flag or... we call it the flagship site for ACR. And we called it that four years ago and it wasn't. We weren't really demonstrating anything because we just started the program. Now I like to call it a model. So like a model ranch where we where we can show people things. Um and, you know, there are several research projects going on out here with um, a bunch of collaborators between the Monarch Joint Venture, Partners for Fish and Wildlife, UC Davis. Um, so we have a lot of there's research going on here. Um, and it always has been, kind of been a hub for research. But I, I want to be able to show people and I want to be able to show other ranchers because the only way to connect with a lot of these folks, it isn't by talking to them or, you know, talking with them, it's by actually showing them the things on the ground that have been successful or or even the things that haven't been successful. Come out, and, come out and show someone a giant project that you did that wasn't successful and then explain to them why. And so I, I think having those aspects as a, as a model ranch is, is important for us here. I was just blown away by the fact that when you said the 40 million acres of rangeland in California out of 90 million acres total, that's almost 50% of the land of California. Oh my gosh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That is it's amazing. It is, it is pretty wild. Um, it's, it's a lot of area. It's hard to wrap, wrap your head around really. Um, I don't know anything about the Shasta Land Trust, um, but we've partnered with land trusts in the past. And so the weird thing about our program is that we thought we would be partnering with ranchers, producers who own land. And we have a bunch of land trusts uh, reaching out to us that want their land certified, even though they don't sell beef. And so it's sort of a, a backwards way of thinking. Our, our program is the only beef certification on the market that's free to our producers. So it doesn't cost anyone anything to be a part of our program. And so 
that's kind of a cool component. And I think land trusts are catching on, in particular land trusts that have cattle grazers. So if a land trust becomes certified, um, then they would require as part of their request for proposals or their leasee to meet all of the standards of our program. So without even needing to, to write up a, a lengthy lease agreement, they can just say, oh, you have to follow the, the protocols of Audubon's program. And then it's it's pretty cut and dry. And so we, we've now certified um, one major land trust um, conglomerate of properties. Uh, and we're working with a few other conservancies right now uh, to do the same thing. So it would be cool to connect with the Shasta Land Trust, especially if they're grazing. Yeah, I don't know how many of their properties are grazed. I know that some of them are because I've been on the properties <laughs> where the cattle are. Um, but uh, we have been just recently within the last year been doing um, programs with them. You know, so they're doing bird walks on their land trust properties. So, yeah, we should probably contact them about, you know, our uh, Audubon group should probably mention this and then see what Shasta Land Trust has to say. Yeah. Send it, send them my way. Let's set up a meeting. I'd love to All do right. it. That, that'd be cool. Um, the Praethers are great and they're doing great things. Uh, four years ago, our program was only grass fed, grass finished. And the reason it was grass fed, grass finished wasn't necessarily associated with like the point source pollution that comes from animal feedlots. Um, but we were anti feedlot because of the way animals are treated there. And because in the Midwest, where our program exists, the biggest constraint to conservation of grasslands is agricultural development. So in the Midwest, people are tilling up native grasslands to grow corn and soy. Corn and soy that are fed in feedlots. And so we thought that if we wanted to stop the conversion of land um, and stop the loss of habitat, that we couldn't promote a product or an animal that was finished in a feedlot. So there's all, there's all those things. Point source pollution, animal health and welfare, and land conversion. So that's why we were a grass-fed, grass-finished program. Uh, about a year and a half ago, we went away from that requirement as part of our program. However, we still require that an animal can't be finished in a feedlot. And so the Prathers are doing cool things for the land. I've met them several times. And previously, uh, they grain finish, and so we couldn't include them. Um, but that's a good reminder that I should probably reach out to them again um, and let them know about the changes in our protocols. Thanks, Shelly. Not that that is all the questions that we have in the chat. Dan, you saw 400 curlews? I don't buy it. That's too many. <laughs> <laughs> There's not that many curlews around. Uh, um, Dan, Dan knows what he's talking about. Dang. Uh, that's, a, that's amazing. They were right behind the Vina Plains fire station? That's that's insane. <laughs> that's that's crazy. So I think they have that that tr the Cal Fire Training Center on the on the Vina Plains Preserve, which is fascinating. And I wish we had enough capacity for research because they have nine different parcels on that Vina Plains Preserve, and they burn one every year as part of a training for Cal Fire. And so it'd be really cool to look at you know, plant species phenology, the way that birds come in after burns, um, and, and the curlews. Um, so yeah, um, I've worked with uh, Andrea a little bit out there on Vina Plains, but that's, they were, that's amazing. They were doing, they were doing helicopter training at the time I saw them and they just took off in the air and it was like, wow, that was amazing. It was just a cloud. <laughs> it was wow. huge. Did you put that on eBird? Yep. Okay. Okay. Cool. Good. Good job. Did, 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 did you get a did you get a a, a red mark on that on a bird when you put that through, Dan? No, I did not. No kidding, yeah. huh? Wow. No, they're, they're common. They commonly come through in the season. It wasn't. It wasn't flagged. Wow. 
That's awesome. I guess it depends on the verifier too. If I get red flags, sometimes I'll just put like a smiley face or say like, trust me. <laughs> and, then, and then they actually reach out to you when you do that. Yeah, I'm going to say, I'm going to try that. We always just say exact count. Yeah. There you go. There you go. Cool. <laughs> um, where, where's Jelly's Ferry Road? Uh, that's, um, on the east side of I-5 between Red Bluff and Cottonwood. Goes out to the Sacramento River in that direction. Cool. It's, a, it's a good birding area. I mean, it got the wetlands. Of, in fact, we were just at the wetlands. It was that last uh, Saturday, Larry, when we went to uh, Haynes Creek. I just took a drive real quick and because we were talking about we'd like to see some of our Lewis's at Beans Creek, which we normally see, but nothing. And then I went up the, just uh, up the road around the corner and saw eight Lewis's right away. So Nice. Yeah, I have yet to see a single one this year or this season. Yeah, they've been a little scarce. Any Any other questions, guys? Okay, follow-up that I have are uh, Larry's going to connect me with the Shasta Land Trust. I'll reach back out to the Prathers. We can talk about a visit to Bobcat Ranch for a birding thing. And then I'm going to reconnect with um, the Eastern Shasta Resource Conservation District and see what ranchers might be interested in. And then I'll connect with you guys to see if potentially there's opportunities to bird or do bird monitoring on places um and then also connect with uh daryl wood if anyone wants to get some of his uh all organic grass fed grass finished beef uh from his place down there in Bina. daryl wood is his name mm -hmm. okay and he's a that was on prather ranch right uh no um that's he calls it levitt lake ranches um, but it, it's a conglomerate of six ranches right there in Vina, including the Vina Plains Preserve for TNC. Was that on Lassen Road? No, I think it's south of there, but I'm not quite sure. Okay. Uh, it's on it's on Deer Creek, so Deer Creek comes through, and then it's on Vina okay. Vina Road. Yeah, there's if you go out um, Lassen Road. And turn up on Meridian, you uh, see part of. Uh, no, okay, I know where it's at. It's north. It's north of there. It's so it's in the town of Vina. Okay, yeah, I got it. Just outside the oh. town of Vina, and that's actually yeah. just south of the Die Creek Preserve. Yeah, uh, for Vina Plains. I know where it's at. Yeah. Cool. You 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 do make sure you stop for some new Clairvaux wine on your way home, don't you? I've never had it, but I need to now. What's the name again? It's uh, on the outskirts of Vina. It's New Clairvaux. They also have a spectacular chapel that they have rebuilt with a lovely backstory. And good wine. Did that <laughs> used to be a did that used to be a monastery? Yes, it, it still, still is. is. It still is. Okay, yeah. I know it. Yeah, it, yeah. me and Daryl went by it. Yeah. yeah, okay, cool. I'll stop by there next time for sure. <laughs> um, great. Well, thanks for joining you guys. Shanae, thanks for joining us. Um, Shanae's going to be in charge of, you know, our, our communications and outreach and, and help with connecting ranchers and chat. Um, she's going to be a, a critical piece to our our big puzzle we're trying to put together. But um, appreciate your guys' time on Valentine's Day, um, and let's let's follow up again soon. Super. Awesome. Thank you so awesome. much. Thanks. Thanks, thanks Matt. And thanks, Thank Shanae. Thanks, yep. guys. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Have a good week.